Hello everyone, so today I wanted to show you how to customise my latest sewing pattern which is a pattern for a wolf wobble doll um, and the aim here is to customise this pattern so that it looks like Fang from Animal Crossing. So what I'm doing here on screen right now is adding um, sections and additional seam allowances so that I can create Fang's white feet and paws. Um, so to do this you need to draw around the segment that you want to be white and also ensure that you add on about a 3mm seam allowance as well. Now Fang also has white cheeks, uh, so it's quite easy to add this on as an extra piece, but you do need to add an additional seam allowance along the bridge of the nose and around the chin, so that when we sew together uh, Fang's face later on, these white pieces are basically incorporated within the seam. To give your wolf a 3D effect mane around the sides of his face, I've split his head pattern into two separate pieces. These pieces do need seam allowances adding on, and this piece in particular only wants the seam allowance adding to half of the face, the front half of the face. You'll see later on how this allows you to create that three-dimensional mane around the sides of his face. Now, if you're interested in where these patterns are, you can find them on my website. If you go to my online store, all of my sewing patterns so far are there, and there's also some free tutorials. Um, I think I've made them relatively easy to understand, but this pattern is one of the hardest ones I've published so far. But don't worry, you will have a video to follow. And on top of that, you'll be able to see here, um, I've also made sure to include lots of diagrams in with the instructions. There are lots of different ways that you can add colour to Fang's inner ears. I prefer to work with a white background and use Copic markers for this. Um, you can use felt, but I find that it adds bulk really, really quickly. And with the Copic markers, you can use lots of different colours to gain some really nice shaded effects, as you can see on screen. Now I've started to create a series of smaller techniques videos. Um, and pinning is actually one of the first videos that I've completed. Uh, the reason is because whenever I film one of these videos I feel like it's important to talk about the techniques but I also realise it can be quite repetitive. So you can see here I'm using a pin just to line up the seams and I'll expand on that in the video which should be published very soon. Now to add the first colours to the heads, what you need to do is you need to actually use the right side of the grey pieces and uh, pin the right side of the white pieces facing outwards like so. The reason that we're doing that is because we want the seams to be hidden within the seam of the um, actual doll so that it doesn't add too much bulk. So you pin that in place and then you'll want to sew around the outside of it using a neat stitch like a pin stitch. To construct the back of the head, line up the back side of the back of the head and the back side of the side of the head so that they're overlapped as you can see on screen and pin them in place and what you're going to do is sew a straight line down the line that you can see there, the diagonal line from the back of the head and that should hold it in place and allow you to create that three-dimensional mane that we talked about earlier, like so. I realise it probably looks alarming that there's an awful lot of pen marks, particularly here on the outside of one of my pattern pieces, um, but actually I use friction markers, so it doesn't really matter here because they can be removed very, very easily using an iron. And here you can see that pin stitch around the outside of the cheeks, as I added on earlier. And I've used that here to attach the ears, but you could use glue, and to be honest, it's probably e easier to use glue as well. What you'll need to do once you've attached your cheek using those stitches is cut away the grey felt just to reduce bulk in that area of the face. 
To make it easier to construct the head later on, you'll want to snip just a small amount into the seam allowance next to the ears so that it's easy to sew around the top of the head. Now constructing the head on this character is probably what makes it a more difficult and more challenging pattern. But the first thing you want to do is sew from the neck up to the nose. And then to make our character's face more three-dimensional, we're going to add a third piece here, which is called the gusset. And what the gusset does is it fills out the top of the head of the wolf. Basically, it's the forehead and then the bridge of the nose. So I always start these by pinning the centre of the gusset into the centre of the nose. The rule with uh, adding any kind of gusset here is that it needs to be really symmetrical. So basically, use an awful lot of pins. Um, professional bear makers will often, I think, use extra strong thread and stitch this by hand, even if they intend to go over it with a sewing machine later. Um, if you're working with a larger head, it can be easier with a pinning. I don't like hand stitching, um, so I tend to go with a heavy, heavy layer of pins, as you can see here. You're going to want to pin one side first, making sure that all of your lines match up using the techniques that I'll cover in that pinning video. And once you're happy with one side and you've pinned it to within an inch of its life, then you can sew it, remove the pins, make sure you're happy, and then pin and sew the other side to match. Now you might be able to see here, just before I started to sew around the gussets, I actually pinned the ears flat against the side of the head. You've got pins there. You will want to remove those before you start turning your character's head around and before you start snipping the seams, just in case you run your scissors over the ends of the pins. Now the nice thing of course about the more involved head patterns is that the second you turn them around you can really see where that pattern is starting to go even before you've started adding stuffing into the head which of course is the next step. Once the head is completely stuffed and it needs to be really firmly stuffed, use a couple of pins to pin the ears in place. The benefit of doing this is that you can adjust the positioning of the ears to the way that you want them to be before you've made any permanent decisions like stitching or gluing them down. One of the downsides of using thread to stitch on the ear linings is that you will get the colour of the thread showing through on the other side, but that can be shaded in carefully using Copic markers um, and a blender pen just to soften the edges. Of course, the type of joint that I use to connect the characters' heads to their bodies is called a wobble joint. Um, there are different types of joints available, but this I think gives the nicest Animal Crossing style effect. And the different types of joint is something that I will cover uh, in a later techniques video as well.
To attach the ears to the sides of the head, I use a stitch called a ladder stitch, which is a practically invisible stitch that's very, very useful for attaching parts on a cuddly toy, like here. Um, and if you work this very carefully and with the rungs very straight, uh, you won't be able to see any of the stitches once it's complete. So you'll want to run ladder stitches along both sides of the ears, front and back. Um, I do actually already have a techniques video on how to complete this ladder stitch. I'm going to use Copic markers to create Fang's eyes. Uh, you could use traditional teddy bear eyes, you could have added in plastic safety eyes before this point, but I find that the best thing for these Animal Crossing characters is to use the Copic markers on a white felt background and to glue or carefully hand stitch the eyes in place once you're happy with their positioning. You can see here I'm using those friction markers that you can remove using an iron just to sketch out the positioning and the rough size of the eyes onto the sides of the character's head and then I am basically sketching the same design onto white felt um, and using that to create a duplicate shape that I can copy in order to create both sides of the character's head or both eyes for both sides I should say. Using Copic markers here to add on the colours and then I tend to go over the black parts as well using a sharpie marker just because I find that gives a deeper black colour. Now if you're a careful adult collector there's no reason why you shouldn't use a little bit of glue to attach parts to your character's head but I would make sure it's a really good um, strong fabric glue. Now what I'm about to do is outline the shape of the nose. The nose here I'm actually going to stitch on using embroidery thread and a traditional teddy bear uh, making technique but I always start by drawing the outline of the nose on first so that I've got a guideline and then I take a thin embroidery thread push that through the bottom of the character's head and here I'm just tying a small knot and I'm going to pin that knot in place on the bottom of the head. It doesn't matter that this is um, standing out from the bottom of the head because we will snip this thread later. What you want to do next is create basically like the rungs of a ladder using your embroidery thread coming out of the top of the nose and then back down leaving about a two millimeter gap between each rung. The reason for doing this is that it means that your tension can be maintained a little bit more evenly across the nose rather than starting from one side and then just working across in a block. Once you've got your sections lined out, you would then just use the thread to fill in the sections until you're happy that you've got no or very, very little of the original felt showing through those sections, like so. One nice little tip is when you're happy with the shape of your nose, you can actually use threads across the top of the nose and around the sides just to make the shape of the nose seem even more perfect. You can see I'm doing that here top and bottom with what little thread I have remaining on my needle. One stitch in there just to lock it off and then push the thread back through the head. I don't think there's any shame in using a black marker here just to fill in any small gaps because you need to add the septum of the nose on anyway. 
Now the mouth can be a little bit more tricky. The most important thing here is that it's evenly shaped and that it matches the character. So draw it on first in a removable pen. Here I'm just gluing the tops of the eyes in place just to give myself a bit of time to let my wrists relax before threading up some extra strong thread and just attaching that firmly with a locking on stitch in the centre of the front of the mouth. Now what you're going to want to do is bring that thread out at the corner of the mouth and take it over to the other corner but then push your needle out at the centre front of the lips as you can see here. Now the reason for that is that we're actually going to use this thread now to loop over the mouth stitch and hold it in place so that there's no chance that that mouth stitch will get lost or slip down the chin. So you want to pull the mouth tight so that you're happy with its position and its tension and then make sure that you push this thread, unfortunately off camera here, but push the thread back through the front of the face on the other side of the mouth stitch. So if you pull that on the top, make sure you push the thread back through at the bottom. What I do then is I bring the thread out the corner of the mouth and just take a few stitches from left to right just so I can pull in the cheeks a little bit and give him even more shape to his face before finally pulling that thread back out through the bottom of the neck and locking it off. This technique is called needle sculpting if you're interested um, and it's a technique again that traditional teddy bear artists will use to give their faces or their bear's faces more character. Before you construct the rest of the character's body, you need to finish the outfit. I'm starting here from a white um, outfit base and I tend to stitch these completely around the outside, missing out the armholes and then trim the armholes later. Just find that easier to give a nice shape to the outfit. So what I'm going to use here is a blue Copic marker. Um, it's quite an awkward pattern to draw out. I've added some hints on how to do this into my pattern instructions, but essentially start with one of the block shapes from his little fair isle jumper, and then you need to replicate it around the outside. The hardest part of this is keeping track of which sections are going to be light and which sections are going to be dark. So you'll see in a moment that I add a little bit of shading to the ones that are going to eventually be the darkest blocks in his jumper pattern, uh, just so that as I follow it around, I don't make the mistake of ending up with two dark pieces next to each other. After trimming all of the seams and turning your character's body around, you can start to connect the pieces together. It can be quite difficult to turn the smaller parts like the feet, so I find using needle nose pliers here is a really useful um, tool. Just make sure that you don't accidentally pull out a chunk of felt instead, which has happened to me on many occasions. When constructing all of these characters, the first step is to push the pin from the head through the outfit, collapse the outfit down so it's out of the way, and then push the pin through the body. If you're not using an outfit, you just go straight from the head into the body, and then you can see the pin is sticking through on the inside of uh, the body piece. Then you can reconstruct the rest of the wobble joint by adding on the appropriate discs and just curling down the legs of the wobble pin. It's especially important with something small like the feet that you stuff those parts first 
and as you've seen here I use the needle nose pliers just to create a small um, fairly compact piece of stuffing just to fill out the bottom of the feet or any other smaller pattern pieces just to make sure that they're completely firmly stuffed before I move on to filling the rest of the body in this case. Once you're happy with the stuffing level of your character, you can close up the seam using a ladder stitch as we use to attach the ears onto the head. To achieve a really nice professional finish when you are constructing the arms, I would make sure that when you attach them to the body, you make sure that the felt side that doesn't have a seam all the way along it is the side that's facing out on both of the arms, so that that's what you see. Now we're going to attach the arms onto the body using a thread joint. It isn't the strongest of joints that you can use. You could use a cotter pin joint here instead, or even a button joint, which gives slightly more strength than the thread joint that I'm using. Uh, but when I've tried this with people who've wanted these characters, people don't tend to like the button joints because you can see the buttons on the outside. So thread joints give them their mobility that they need, and as long as they are not played with too roughly, they should be fine. As the tail has such sudden changes in directions in its design, it's important that you snip into the curves and trim the seam allowance quite close on the ends of the point so that when you turn the tail around, you do get that complete spike effect that you will be looking for. And again, use small pieces of stuffing to stuff those far away and small parts first before you close the tail up using a ladder stitch. The tail on Fang is really the only part that I thought should be made using white felt and shading rather than grey and white felt because I was worried that the extra seam from stitching two different felts together would add too much bulk to this very very small part. So you can see here I've used a Copic marker just to add a bit of grey shading because it's on his back it's not going to be too obvious. And then I'm going to use essentially a modified ladder stitch just to sew the tail in place. I'm relatively loose with these stitches, you can see I'm basically sewing around um, all four corners of the end of the tail um, and I'll keep that relatively loose so that he's got some nice movement in his tail. And with some minor sprucing, that is essentially fang complete. I hope you've enjoyed watching the video. All the additional small tutorials I'll be adding to this channel as well. So if you're interested in those, it's worth keeping an eye out for them in the future. Thanks for watching.